Il manquait plus que ça. On en reparlera. Voilà, nous allons commencer, mesdames. Ladies and gentlemen, let's make a start. Let's start this panel discussion, which will uh, look at questions of peace and security and the protection of the integrity of women and the role of women in all of this. So I'm very, very pleased to have some excellent speakers here today. I would like to start off, first of all, by introducing Jody Williams. You may or may not have heard of her. She was a law Nobel Peace Laureate in 1997, and she waged a terrible war against anti-personnel mines. This is a battle that has been won with a ban being in place, but we still need to do some more work to get a definitive eradication of these mines. But her work has been key in the work of um, fighting these mines, and particularly it's been significant for women. So she's been decisive in her work in this field. I'd like to give you the floor, madam. Hello, can you hear me? I'm going to ask the ladies in the room to pay attention. I have noticed that women here are talking to each other instead of paying attention to the speakers. No one, I find if we do not respect each other, how can we expect men to respect us? <laughs> hmm? And if you need to have a conversation, I invite you to go outside and do it, not in the room. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? I'll be happy to lean. Or you can put on your, your things in English. All right, my name is Jody Williams. I did receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997, along with thousands and millions of people in 90 countries around the world who came together to ban anti-personnel landmines. I say this with great sincerity because no one person changes the world. All change comes about because people work together to bring about change. Or people work together to maintain the status quo and power. And no offense, gentlemen, I'm hoping that the ones in the room are progressive. But as we know, people in power are not excited to give it up. The longer people are in power, the less excited they are to give it up. And since men have been in power since the Stone Ages, it is taking a bit of effort to change our world. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just read a couple things that stuck in my mind as I listen to other people. Women must redefine politics. Accepted ways of doing things are not going to work. I only heard one woman allude to war, and that would be Hillary Clinton, uh, at the same time, Mrs. Clinton is a hawk, I have to point out. It's a contradiction. Mrs. Clinton said that women must negotiate disarmament treaties. I would add to all of us that real leadership is not timid. That real leaders have the courage to do things differently. Uh, that real leaders don't care what their party thinks. I saw there is a working group about political parties. Are they our friends or are they our foes? I'm not sure. I know in some countries women's names are put on party voting lists just so they can say they have a woman and then the woman doesn't say a word. That is not bringing about change. 
I'm going to step back now and speak a little bit globally about women, peace, and security. The panel's title is Women, Peace, and the Integrity of the Person. Um, I prefer for a minute to set the stage in a global fashion for what you will hear after. You will not have to endure me speaking on the panel because you will have heard me already. Um, my work has always been against war and weapons. Uh, my first protest in 1970 was against the U.S. war in Vietnam, <clears throat> and I've never stopped. When we think about women, peace, and security in today's world, I find we tend to be talking about UN Resolution 1325, UN Resolution 1820. I can't remember all the others. But resolutions to take care of our women, as I have heard men still say, we need to protect our women, and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I'm an adult human. I can protect myself. Thank you very much. Well. But if we are going to speak about peace and security, I think we need to think about what are we talking about? Peace is not simply the absence of armed conflict, as we know. Sustainable peace has to be built on a different framework of security. In this teeny globe where everything affects everything affects everything, we cannot simply think about national security anymore. I don't even know what that means. Well, actually I do, and that's what makes me upset. National security is about protecting the power of the state. National security is about protecting the power of the state, and then if the citizens get protected, excellent. And if they don't, who's going to fight for them and their rights? We need to redefine security in terms of human security, which does not mean that we do not need police. It does not mean necessarily that we do not need military. But what we need them for is defense, not perpetual war, which obviously we see. And we are told over and over and over again that war is inevitable, that human beings are so emotional that they cannot control their emotions and their desire to fight. I would say that's a testosterone problem. It is not an estrogen problem. Let's be real here. If we want to change this world, we have to start talking about the continuum of violence. Not just what many of us will be speaking about now, rape and gender violence in conflict, which my organization, the Nobel Women's Initiative, does work on. But protecting women in war it certainly needs to happen, but what really needs to happen is stop War. It is a choice. War is not just something that happens, people. War is a choice. And too many times I have seen women who are elected to parliaments or Congress who vote for war. And then I wonder what kind of voice is that? That's not a voice I want to support. I have heard People talk about great women leaders, and I'm going to have to name them. I think most of them are dead. That would be Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher. I'm sorry. These are women who behaved like men. They are not different from the power structure. <laughs> I 
I don't want to emulate women who buy into the power structure and once they're there, act exactly like men. If you aren't going to be a different kind of parliamentarian, why are you there? If we're really working to bring women's voices into positions of power, whether it be economic power, political power, etc., and they're going to act just like men, then we're not going to get diversity. We're not going to get a different world that we desperately need or we will not survive. I know that's ugly to say. It is the truth. We need to recognize that rape happens in war because women are treated like <clears throat> whatever around the world. The Secretary General of the UN noted that one out of every three women in their lifetime will suffer sexual harassment or assault. I was raped during the Salvadoran War by a member of the Salvadoran death squads trained by the United States of America, that is my country. The assault was an attempt to scare me to stop working with the poor, to scare me to stop working with those trying for democratic change, to scare my organization into leaving the country. Ha! It did not happen. I did not feel my honor was assaulted. I did not feel like a victim. I thought the person who we need to be looking at is the f man who assaulted me. Why do we keep looking at the women like they did something wrong? When are we going to... Sorry. When are we going to shift the focus from women and what they were wearing or what they might have been drinking to the men who take their male member out of their pants and use it? Who, who is the one who should be focused on? The perpetrator or the woman who has been violated by a creepy man who thinks it's his right. It isn't. And we need to talk about that violence continuum that allows that to happen, and we keep brushing it off because violence is inevitable. No, it isn't. When my country chose to invade, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna criticize any other country. I'm gonna criticize my own, because I feel like I can. I would criticize others, but then I think Silvana would get mad at me. So I'll stick to my own country. When my country illegally invaded Iraq based on lies and made up information, that was a choice of violence. That was not just, ooh. <laughs> if we want to change that, we do need women in parliament who will stand up and say no to war. I, I, I could go on with some other countries, but I shan't. I'm really controlling myself, Silvana. <laughs> You're welcome. But I note also, just because I, you know, six of us who received the Nobel Peace Prize, women, as soon as we recognized there were that many of us, we decided we would work together and use our Nobel Prize to support the work of women around the world working for sustainable peace based on human security, not national security, with justice and equality. Just like everything else we've been talking about, sexism in government, sexism in industry, there is also sexism in the Peace Prize. In the first 75 years of the Nobel Peace Prize, three women, three. Since 1976, there have been 12, which is still not very many. And yet, as soon as we recognized that we had a, like, a, a, a quorum, we created a group to work together to support women. 
I note, I think, there have been something like 95 men who have received the Nobel Peace Prize, some of whom I love very much, some of whom do not deserve it. I won't name them Silvana. Have we ever seen men banding together to do the Nobel Min Men's Initiative? We do have a different way of thinking, a different way of acting, and it does not mean we are all perfect. As we know from the women I mentioned before who have been heads of state, and I would never vote for them in my life. I do want to see women in power. I want to see women in industry. But I don't want to see women in power if they're going to be silent in the face of male dominance, if they are going to continue to vote for war, when we all know that it is women and children who suffer the most in war, when we all know that 80% of refugees are women and children. If we can mouth those figures, why are we not doing more to stop war? Not working to make women safe during war. We need to deal with war in today. No, they're making me shut up. We need to deal with war in today's world. You can hit me with the mallet. <laughs> no violence. I am peacefully not violent. But I am no Mother Teresa. The Nobel Peace Prize does not turn you into Mother Teresa. I will tell you every one of the six women who are part of our Nobel Women's Initiative are fierce, fearless, and are determined to change this world. And I challenge every woman in Parliament here and the others who couldn't come to be fearless. Thank you. Okay, well, we couldn't really have had a better introduction to our discussion. Uh, uh, that was uh, very forceful and very good. So I'd like to present our second speaker now, uh, Dennis Mukwege. I think it comes at a very opportune moment after what you have explained about rape and about uh, women uh, not being victims here. I think uh, Dr. Mukwenge from the Pansy Hospital in the Democratic Republic of Congo daily uh, does incredible work. He gives back uh, dignity to these women, their physical integrity, uh, helps them get back what they've lost because of the organised violence uh, uh, committed uh, by militants and others. I will give him the floor. He was uh, he wasn't a Nobel Prize winner, but I think uh, despite being a man, he would have uh, deserved it. He's really worked for women and with women. So I will give him the floor for five minutes to tell us uh, the most important uh, points. Uh, who knows, maybe in this room there are some future Nobel laureates amongst the women in this room who after this uh, meeting will go out and fight for what they believe in. So Mr. McQuiggy, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, parliamentarians, ministers. Uh, to all the participants, it's a real privilege to be here and to be part of this panel, to be here next to uh, Jody. I think we share a lot in terms of our vision, uh, in terms of conflict, being with uh, Mrs. Bangura. We work together on a regular basis, so I am very honoured to be here this morning. This uh, panel is talking about the mother of female empowerment, peace, security and the integrity of the person. 
A few years ago in my everyday practice, I treated a young girl, a minor. I don't think she fully understand, understood what had just happened to her. She had been raped with extreme brutality. She then had a urinary incontinence. Uh, all uh, her genital organs were destroyed simply. We carried out several operations. In the end, we managed to re-establish her uh, urinary continence. We uh, managed to, to uh, carry out some repairs to her genital organs. She was very beautiful. She had sparkling eyes. She was intelligent. She was signed up to our empowerment program for women and girls. She chose education. In a few years, she will become a nurse. She kept saying to me, I would like to become a nurse because I would like to help others. And that really touched me. And I think that's what Jodie was saying. Women have something which is different. She uh, suffered uh, so much. Uh, and now becoming an adult and a nurse, uh, she can uh, be autonomous. She can earn uh, money. And those people around her were touched by her beauty. Every time she met someone and she thought she could start her life again, what happened was that she realised that her physical integrity had been stolen from her. She didn't have her functioning genital organs. Every time this was something that came back again, and again, and she'd come back to me as an adult to ask me, Doctor, will I have my period? She would ask me if she could have a child. She asked me how it would be possible for her to have normal sexual relations. This uh, young girl who had lost that because of this barbaric act. It wasn't just her physical integrity that had been affected, but this also led to psychological problems. And uh, this uh, was so serious that sometimes it affected her work as a nurse. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very extreme case that I'm telling you about. But there are a whole range of cases in between. Jodie told us what happened to her. She managed to overcome that. Uh, but all those women who have to experience sexual violence, who are raped, this is a direct attack on their physical integrity and their psychological integrity. And it changes the course of their life in one way or another you can come out of this but you will not be the same as before when we talk about the empowerment of women we have to bear in mind this aspect it's a crucial objective it's something which is difficult to obtain in a number of countries particularly in mine at the democratic republic of congo there are numerous projects looking at the empowerment of women, at promoting equality and gender parity, but we still see that women are underrepresented in the institutions, they're not well treated, they're discriminated against, uh, and it's against the general interests of society. We need to support these projects but unfortunately they haven't really managed to resolve the fundamental questions that we ask ourselves today the mother of female empowerment is peace security 
and of course the integrity of women in periods of conflict and instability women are the first to suffer insecurity and war simply exacerbate uh, a situation that already exists in times of peace now women uh even in countries uh, in periods of peace there are still women who are dying because of domestic violence when you have chaos insecurity war the absence of the state a situation of impunity then this phenomenon is amplified to levels where women simply don't have a place in society anymore And I think that's why Jodie was insisting that you have to fight against war. It's a decision which is taken. If you don't have peace, if you don't have security, the physical integrity of women will always be at risk. Without peace, we cannot contribute to a fairer society where women can be empowered and contribute to progress. In the Pansy Hospital, the victims of violence that we uh, treat, they're not looking for empowerment at the beginning. They don't come uh, for capacity building they come because they simply want to have control over their bodies again and they want someone to tell them that they're human beings they want to find their integrity again in a context of armed conflict when a woman is raped it's not just a non-consenting uh, sexual relations i go further than that uh, rape has nothing to do with sex. We have to be very clear about that. You're denying someone's humanity. You are taking away that person's ownership of their body by destroying their genital organs in this way. You're taking away their right their joy at being able to give life and being the mother of humanity. When women come to the hospital, they have been stigmatized and they bear the burden uh, of this. Uh, this is why we don't just treat the physical wounds of our patients. but we try to help uh, reinforce their mental well-being as well. We help them to rediscover their humanity and rediscover what was stolen from them, their physical integrity, their psychological integrity and their dignity. It's only after this phase that we suggest a program looking at uh, economic autonomy now once a woman starts asking what am i going to do what am i going to become once i leave the hospital once i leave the project that's a sign of healing to us a woman who's been mentally and physically affected she doesn't even think about becoming autonomous so once we're talking about this issue uh, it's important to deal with the physical and, and psychological integrity first so that a woman feels strong enough to be able to properly enter into, into life where it's not always easy. We also facilitate access uh, to the legal system, to justice for those who want it. Now, we don't uh, oblige them to do it, but for those people who want to, uh, if they want to help in that fight against impunity then we support them in this we think it's very important in preventing this from occurring again preventing future violence 
the results are clear. We've had patients who have left the hospital and our projects completely transformed because we have helped them to understand and to realize their full capacity and the value they have and everything that they have to offer. These women are not just surviving, they become actors of change in their families, in their communities, within society. They become real community leaders, whether it's at the market, in church, you can see when you have gone from this situation of being a victim, you don't want to be treated in this way anymore. And then you move on to the phase of being an activist. You find the strength to uh, reappropriate your values. We provide support to these women and then they become capable of educating their own children and influencing a future generation, a new generation of men and women who are conscious that uh, they are equal and that their lives have the same value. Ladies and gentlemen, if we want a world where women are equal to men, we have to ensure that women have their physical and moral integrity so that they can create their place in society in an environment which is often not respectful of the rights of women so that they can become empowered and fully participate. If we want to create a fairer world, we have to take this position. We have to speak out against what is unacceptable. We have to draw a line and say this is not acceptable. The international community has fixed limits when it's come to genocide, when it comes to chemical weapons. We've seen that recently. Women parliamentarians can help draw the red line when it comes to rape as a tool of war. You can do this, ladies. You can help to draw this red line. We cannot say that we want to achieve the empowerment of women while we still accept these atrocities being committed to uh, against women just because there are women. If we don't take a position here, we're accepting the idea that women are not equal as human beings compared to men because rape with extreme violence goes against our very humanity. This humanity belongs to men as well as women. Thank you. Merci, merci, Doctor, for this. Uh... Thank you, uh, Doctor, for your account uh, and uh, for urging us to never again accept a rape in this way. This is a fight that belongs to all of us, I think. I'll give the floor to Mrs Zainab Bangura, who is Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict Zones, who works closely with Dr Mukwege, who will give us her views on this situation. Mrs Bangura, you have the floor. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely delighted to be part of this distinguished panel. The title of this panel, particularly the phase, The Mother of Female Empowerment, reminded me of an inspiring group of women, mothers, and war victims I met in the aftermath of conflict in my homeland, Sierra Leone. These women came from Kailan District in eastern Sierra Leone. And I would like to start by sharing their story. During the dark days of our brutal civil war, most of these women were abducted by rebels, gang raped at gunpoint, and left for dead. I met them when I went to Kailan to record testimonies for the special courts for Sierra Leone. 
I expected to find a group of broken women haunted by the horror they had endured. Instead, I was struck by their will to survive, to realize their potential in life, and to reclaim their destiny. With the help of small loans, these women started their own businesses. The confidence and capital this gave them enabled them not only to become successful business women, but some of them even ran for local council elections. They used this political platform to forge a network of women who also went on to build small businesses and contribute to governments. These women were not victims. Their suffering does not define them. They are leaders, mothers, agents of empowerment, and beacons of hope. This power and spirit of resilience I saw in my own country, Sierra Leone, inspires and animates my work as United Nations Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflicts. Indeed, my approach is to harness this power by always keeping the survivors, their faces, voices, and stories at the center of all our relationship and our effort to combat the scourge. I believe that survivors are their own best advocates. My role, therefore, is to champion their cause, build bridges between them, and amplify their voices in policy debates. Speaking out against sexual violence and tearing down the walls of silence, shame, and stigma that surround it can empower women as pillars of the community and pillars of peace. I know this because I have seen it happen. In my own life, I have experienced the havoc of conflict and its impact on the most vulnerable. Women are the fabric of society. They put the food on the table. They bring forth and nurture the next generation. Guaranteeing women's physical integrity enables them to claim their rightful role in political and economic life. By contrast, the threat of violence inhibits women's participation and thereby cripple the most vital constituency for peace and for development. Strategies to protect women are the best possible strategies for bringing lasting peace and ultimately for sustainable development. Therefore, strategies to protect women cannot be an afterthought in our peacemaking, peacekeeping and peace building. Instead, such strategies must be the central calculus and our most urgent priority. Because we can be rest assured that the social and economic progress will be stalled if women are unable to safely access fields, market places, water point or pooling boat, if girls are unable to safely get to school. In order to turn the tide on the violence that women face, particularly conflict-related sexual violence, we must shatter the culture of impunity that shrouds this crime. Unfortunately, in times of war, mass rape is met with mass impunity. Moreover, many legal systems trivialize this crime, demean and even criminalize the victims. The unacceptable reality is that today it is still largely cost free to rape a woman or a girl in war. Sexual violence has been used precisely because it is such a cheap but at the same time devastating weapon. To turn the tide, we must escalate the cost and consequences for those who will rape for political or military gain. We must use all our means to this end and pursue the perpetrators whoever and wherever they are. We know that rape is always about power and control, but in times of war, it can take on a strategic twist as a means of advancing military, political, and economic aims. In the DRC, as my friend and colleague on this panel, Dr. Mokwege, can attest, sexual violence is linked with campaigns of looting forced displacement and a revenge against communities for their perceived political allegiance. 
In Liberia, staggering rates of rape persist a decade after the guns have fallen in silence. Even though President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf has championed the protection of women and girls among her highest priorities. In Guinea Conakry in 2009, scores of women who joined peaceful demonstrations were raped by the military and told, you wanted power, this is what you will get. In the Arab Spring, women protesters, reporters and volunteers have faced rape, the tension and lack of recognition in the wake of revolution. In Bosnia, right here in the heart of Europe, women who survived the rape camps in the early 90s are unable to pick up the pieces of their life because they have seen no justice or reparation. And they are raising a generation of children who themselves carry the stigma of sexual violence, many of them born of rape. This is compounded by the harassment, intimidation, and even killings of women's rights defenders and journalists who dare to tell women's stories to the world. To eradicate conflict-related sexual violence requires a wholesale change in the culture or DNA of peace and security institutions and processes to ensure that they're accessible and responsive to women. Among other things, there is a need to build gender competence into armed, security, and peacekeeping forces and equip them in an operational sense to detect and prevent these crimes. We must ensure that no peace agreement or ceasefire agreement is signed without specific reference to sexual violence in order to ensure that these crimes are actively monitored and adequately addressed in post-conflict transitional justice and reparation frameworks. In security sector reform processes, we must ensure that those who commit or command or condone sexual violence are not allowed to assume positions of influence and power in new security institutions. At the level of international law and policy, there has been dramatic progress. Robust accountability regimes have been adopted, from the Rome Statutes of the International Criminal Court to the series of Security Council resolutions that recognize rape as a tactic of war and outline for the first time a preventive framework. The instruments that now exist are sharp-edged tools in the hands of women everywhere. They are tools for advocacy, leverage, and empowerment. They represent a new consensus on making global security policy work for women. Today, the notion of sexual violence as a war crime, crime against humanity, an act of genocide, is inscribed in the agenda of world's power, paramount peace and security body, the United Nations Security Council. This is the result of decades of activism by women's group. Understanding sexual violence as integral to the waging of war gives renewed impetus to the inclusion of women and their experiences in the building of peace. This forum comes at a critical moment. The political momentum at this time is unprecedented in history. This year alone, the countries of the G8, among the world's most powerful economies, adopted a historic declaration to prevent sexual violence in conflict under the leadership of the United Kingdom and Foreign Secretary William Hague. In September this year, during the opening of the United Nations General Assembly, 135 countries endorsed a similar declaration and commitment. And in April and June, we witnessed two ministerial-level open debates of the Security Council on sexual violence in conflict, culminating in a new resolution 2106, which established the preventive framework to which I have referred and emphasizes the central role of civil society. Therefore, I do believe that we have the necessary tools to consign sexual, conflict-related sexual violence to the history books. Now it is imperative that we convert the political momentum into practical action and drive meaningful change on the ground. Indeed, if sexual violence persists, it is not for lack of laws and policies. It is because these laws and policies are inadequately enforced. Since second office, I have stressed that nowhere is political will and action more important than at the country level, at the scene of the crimes. 
the commitment of the International Committee, however strong and determined it may be, can never substitute for national ownership, leadership, and account responsibility. We can support national act actors to assume their responsibility, but we can never assume that responsibility for them. Ultimately, it is national authorities who bear the primary legal and moral responsibility to protect their people, whether it is a woman walking to market in eastern Congo, a girl collecting firewood outside a camp in Darfur, or a female student taking a stand in Tahir Square. Their physical security is the best measure of national security. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that the international community supports with adequate and timely resources and technical expertise capacity those governments who make and are prepared to implement concrete commitments to address sexual violence. Ladies and gentlemen, global summits such as this one reminds us that success will depend on solidarity and our unity of purpose. Let us rise together to ensure peace and security for women, and thereby full women empowerment. Let us do this in tribute to the women survivors of war and adversity, who have gone on to become agents of empowerment and change, like the women of Kalan District in Eastern Sierra Leone, and many others like them across the world. Thank you. des lieux et ses perspectives et je donne maintenant la parole à madame Cathy Calvin. Thank you for giving this perspective. I'd like to now give the floor to Cathy Calvin, the president and CEO of the UN Foundation. She will tell us her perspective and how it links into other issues connected to energy and wider spanning issues and multidisciplinary areas. I'd like to give you the floor madame Calvin. Merci beaucoup. Uh, it's good to see everyone again today. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. I'm so happy to be able to follow Zainab because she's laid the foundation for why action is so possible now. We know we have uh, the tools in UN resolutions. We know how we have the commitment in people like you. We just need to make sure that by 2015, when we look at the progress and stock taking against Security Resolution 1325, we can be able to report much greater progress. So let me just review very quickly the goals of 1325. It was to reduce the, conflict, the number of conflicts around the world. It was to eliminate rape as a weapon of war and an intended consequence of war. It was to combat the culture of impunity, which Zainab referred to, for sexual violence, and to ensure that we can build sustainable peace. That takes the full power of both men and women, and it's not doing us any favor. It's not just a nice thing to do. It's an essential thing to do. If we look at the history of non-combatants who have been wounded or killed in conflict over the past 50 years, it's a telling reason why women must stand up. In World War I, non-combatants were only 10% of those who were killed or wounded. In World War II, it was 50%. But in African conflicts in the last 10 to 15 years, it's as high as 90%. And those are women and children. So what can we do? Well, it's so simple. There's three things I want to put forward. The first is that we must include women in negotiations. So I know that's a simple thing, but right now, in the last 20 years, we've signed hundreds of peace treaties, less than 8% of the negotiators were women. We can certainly do better than that. Second, we need to support the grassroots women's organizations that are working to stop violence and promote peace in their communities. They are powerful weapons, and we need to make sure they have the support and tools to do the job they need to do. And third, we need to recruit more female peacekeepers. I'm so glad Zainab mentioned this as well. We need to train them. We need to ensure that the culture of sexual violence that sometimes exists in the countries in which they're working is something they're trained to deal with. There are three all-women peacekeeping units in the world right now, in Liberia, Haiti, and the, and the DRC. We know we can do much more. In the 13,000 peacekeepers that are in existence now, roughly 3% 
are women serving in military positions, 10% are women serving in police positions, and 30% are serving in civilians. Women as peacekeepers are a sustaining force for peace. So why not? We need to take this on as a serious obligation. Every country that either pays for peacekeeping or provides peacekeepers, and I want to say thank you to all of those who do, it's a very valuable and honorable tradition, certainly can help. So let's all commit. Yeah, thank you all. To, com to uh, empowering women to be instruments of peace and security. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Mrs. Calvin, for those figures. It's true. When you look at the figures for women involved in security negotiations, peace negotiations, it's rather shocking to see how low those numbers are. It's absolutely crucial that we get more women involved in this field. I'd now like to give the floor to Louis Michel. I'm sure you know him. He was a former Commissioner for Development. He's now an MEP and President of the ACP EU Parliamentary Assembly, and he has very been very committed in Africa, working for peace, peace negotiations in Africa. And I'd now like to give him the floor to give us his perspective. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, it's always difficult to follow speakers who have been so moving in their testimony. So uh, I am humble in what I will say, and what I may say will sound banal, perhaps. Compared to what's been said by the previous speakers. But let me take this opportunity, nevertheless, to focus in on one aspect of this problem. And it's something we don't talk about very much. And it's perhaps because we shy away from it for cultural reasons or other regions, reasons. I don't know why we talk about um, it in this, these terms. Now, violence against women as has been said, is one of the major challenges of our time. But in some cultures, and we call them cultures, I know it's not perhaps the right word to use, but for lack of a better word, I use the word, and it is believed in those cultures that women do not have ownership of their own bodies. They are subject to paternal supervision and then marital supervision, and there's a societal and cultural climate that surrounds them. And others have already said this, as Belgian uh, journalist has said, that this has become a battlefield. And this is in the worst of cases. Now, it may seem obvious, it ought to be obvious, but each individual first and foremost belongs to himself or herself and if there's anything else that they belong to they belong to humanity and nothing else that's my firm conviction so this battle is about defending fundamental human rights the rights of men and women and concepts such as religion politics or cultural models, traditions, rites and rituals. They may well be honourable concepts in some cases, but in my view, there can be no case where such concepts can be invoked in order to question the basic right of a person's ownership of their own identity. Now, there are questions that have been identified. These concepts have been shaped not by women. They have been defined and shaped by men. When you look at religion, so you look at cultures, you don't see any basis for these beliefs, or for these 
pretexts, I call them. They're simply convenient pr practices that have been invented by men in order to defend themselves or to protect themselves and to cover up their fears. They're so in this debate, let's not engage in any kind of relativeness, relativism when it comes to these pretexts that are often invoked. Quite often it's a case of terrible, uh, grave errors being made in in this way. And when I listened to Dr. McQuig and other speakers, the uh, very, very um, passionate speak by speech by the uh, Nobel Prize laureate, I would say that this is a universal consideration. Anything else is uh, just artificial and it's uh, convenient for different interests. So Verhofstadt said that you can't identify a human being by one characteristic, the color of the skin, um, whether they're bald or not. We are multifaceted beings, we have a number of different identities, and I believe that those who have the most off to offer to society are the ones who accept and acknowledge their many facets. So, to conclude, what I want to say is that the international community has a huge responsibility in this regard, and there's a great deal of national responsibility as well. Sometimes development policy has failed in the past. Physical and moral integrity needs to be defended by public powers, impartial, impartial neutral bodies, a neutral judiciary, a neutral educational system, a neutral administration, that's important, and access to culture. I think that culture is a driver for change and that should be uh, borne in mind. I just come back from Addis Ababa and uh, where I participated in a meeting. I looked at some uh, statistics that had been published and I learned that in Africa alone natural resources produce 3.3 billion euros. So 3.3 billion. I checked those figures because I initially thought I'd misunderstood the publication, but three more than 3 billion euros that are not taxed. Can you just imagine what could be done in order to uh, build states, to create a uh, uh, systems to guarantee human rights in countries, in these African countries. I think you have to recognize that there's a great deal of need in, term, in developmental terms. When I listen to the conditions that people like Dennis McQuigge work in, in order to do their work and in order to su serve society, to diminish that human suffering I really feel that it is a pertinent question we should be asking ourselves. I I was very, very happy to hear what was said earlier on. It did strike me as a woman, uh, as a man. Someone said that if women are do politics, then they need to do it differently. They shouldn't try to emulate men and pretend to be men but, uh, and in this way be successful. No, they have something special to contribute to humanity and I really believe that is important. It's true. National security, which is invoked in order to justify a number of different questions, is perpetuating a uh, status quo. So I just wanted to um, come back to that, say that I didn't want to get um, bogged down in uh, repeating catchphrases, but I 
truly believe that uh, women's empowerment is a fundamental point. I don't, don't, don't want to get repetitive at this point, but I just wanted to say I was very, very struck and touched by the statements and uh, the comments we've heard from people who have shared their experiences, who have told us about their battles. Now, I know that some of these people, when they do take the floor, are absolutely fascinating to listen to. Merci, merci, Louis Michel. Thank you very much, Louis Michel. Thank you very much for what you've said about the question of culture and identity, which leads us in very smoothly to our final speaker from Baluchistan, Rubina Ifran and she is here to speak to us, to give us her perspective. Madam, since you are the uh, final speaker, you will have an opportunity to sum up. Honourable Chair, members of the European Parliament, Your Excellencies, respected panellists, colleagues, members of the Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honour and a pleasure for me to be afforded the opportunity to speak as a panelist at this August gathering of my distinguished colleagues from parliaments across the world at the annual summit of women in parliaments and share my views with them on this session's topic. I have come to believe that each of us has a personal calling and that's unique. And each one of you sitting there is a unique person. And everybody has a unique way, a unique way of working. This uniqueness has got you here. And beyond that is your work. Woman in Parliament, woman empowerment, is neither a mere fashionable statement, nor a feminist agenda. It is simply the sheer need of the hour. How wrong is it for a woman to expect to build the world she wants, rather to create it herself? I think we women are different. If you are different, you will stand out. Woman equal participation is also a necessary condition for women and women's interests to be taken into account is needed in the order to strengthen democracy and promote its proper functioning. In Pakistan, 2002 was the year for women. 33% of women representation was given. 33% in local bodies 17.5% in the Provincial Assemblies, National Assembly, and the Senate. And that was the way towards success. But remember that it was not success. Still, we had to go a hard way up. How could we go it? How? With, without experience? You don't need an experience. It's the feeling here if you want to do something for your woman. We had to stand united. Women in our parliaments, no matter which party they belong to, which race they belong to, whichever religion they belong to, above party agendas, where women was concerned, they were together. And we need this support here too. We work together and Pakistan state in the conventions of all forms of discrimination against women. We ratified the CEDAW in 1996, which reflects our long-standing commitments for the cause of women's rights. Pakistan has been regularly presenting implementations of conventions to the committee. The committee commended the steps taken by the government for advancement of women's rights. The committee also identified loopholes in the implementation of the convention 
which are committed to overcome. A national commission on status of women has been placed for the last 12 years. The parliament has further strengthened it by making it more financially and administratively autonomous. Women in Pakistan continue to play an important role in advancing the cause of democracy and human rights. The government has taken a number of initiatives for the advancement of women in the country. For economic, social empowerment of women, 10% of quota in civil services has been reserved. Political empowerment of women has been among the top priorities. Currently, there are 66 women legislators in the National Assembly of Pakistan out of 30, 342. We have also measures, we have taken measures to stop the practice of honor killing of women. Legislation was passed in Pakistan in 2004 in form of the Criminal Laws Act 2004. Violence against women, that is not only in Pakistan, but all over the world. If we really have to protect them, how can we protect them? We have to strengthen them and strengthen them by one voice. Today I feel proud to be sitting here and talking in front of the world. I call this a world and this is our success. I, I admire the Nobel Prize winner, Peace Award winner, Jody Williams, because we met a decade ago and she still remembered what I had said that in a forum in New York. This is how we are going to strengthen ourselves by being united. I believe united we stand and united we'll win. That's the agenda we should go. <laughs> Empowerment of any section of a society, especially women who continue facing traditional discrimination and a mindset will remain a myth until they fit towards chains are not based on bedrock of basic preconditions, mainly peace, security, and integrity of the person. We must lay down firm foundation of freedom, justice, and fraternity, recognizing and acknowledging the dignity and of e equal and inalignment rights to all the members of the society, especially women. We must guarantee and ensure that the women enjoy their social, political, cultural and economic rights if we are truly committed to bring a meaningful change whereby women can achieve full dignity and social status along with special protection from violence and maltreatment during wars and conflict. Women's vulnerability to violence and the long-term impact it has in their lives, such as social exclusion, entrenchment of poverty, and exposure to more violence, are all a consequence of gender and gender inequality, a malice to that must be cured. It is undoubtedly a task that no single government, state, or an organization can achieve alone. We are all in this together. We must put concrete efforts requiring building at national, regional and international levels between parliaments and legislators, between watchdogs and human rights groups to achieve and the desired results. There is also a need to confirm relevant national laws and legal frameworks as per international covenants. UN resolutions concerned. I believe, I believe that every woman here has a success story. Every woman sitting here has a long way and had a long way to come here and reach here. I know it myself. I've been through it. 
It's not my first term in the parliament. It's my third term in the parliament. I started from the provincial assembly. I had critics. I come from the remote area of Balochistan in Pakistan, where women, they are deprived of water, clean drinking water, education, leave alone the other facilities of life. It is a taboo when you say that the girls are going to school there. Yes, after Pakistan was built, there are schools there, but they are ghost schools, most of them. There are no teachers. Girls going to school, do they have security? A parliamentarian, a woman parliamentarian, does she have security when she goes to work, for social work? She goes to meet her people? Here we need to be united. And united, I mean by you all. Those countries which are really, the women are in problem. The women need a voice. And each one, because we are unique, we are women. I find the women are more articulate, hardworking, and above all, honest. Honesty is the main agenda. When I see a woman, she thinks like a mother, she thinks like a sister, she thinks like a daughter. And that's what she will think for her country. And she will never betray the people of her country, she will never betray the humanity. We need a change. And it is undoubtedly a task that no single government can do it. I conclude on these words of Pakistan's former Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto. The people of Pakistan want change. Change from a climate of threat to one of stability and prosperity. And we cannot achieve this aim without the participation of women. Thank you very much. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers amis, je pense que... Ladies and gentlemen, friends, what we've heard here from the four corners of the world, from the United States, Africa, Asia, I think cannot just exist in a vacuum. There must be a follow-up to this, beyond this forum. This must resonate beyond this forum. This must give us the courage to make changes where we live, where we are elected, and this should push and inspire us all, in, whether it be in the United States, in Europe or elsewhere. We need to struggle for peace, security, but for unity, the unity of women, not to work just for women, but for, to work for humanity, because when women act, it's good for women and men alike. So I hope that you've all been able to take something away from today's speeches. You've taken away some inspiration or something that you can use in order to bring about real changes where you come from and to make other people do the same. I'd like to thank the interpreters. I'd like to... Uh, I won't, unfortunately, have the time to uh, open this discussion up to the floor, but I'd like to finally just hand over to Silvana to give us a bit of more information. Perhaps you could tell us what the plan is for the rest of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, I have